Okay, let's, uh, let's begin our uh, happy hour for today. Uh, we're very uh, pleased to uh, have with us uh, once again Ed Romand. Uh, we've uh, called him our poet. Uh, we've never <coughs> asked him if he would allow us to do that, uh, but we, we just decided it without, without asking. Uh, Ed is, as you know, a poet, uh, but he's uh, also a, a composer. He's written a couple of uh, musical plays. Um, he's had written eight books of poetry. Is it eight or is it more than that now? Eight. It's still eight. You have one more you got to do, please. Uh, we're working on it. You're working on it. Okay, good. Um, Ed is married to Mary, who is here with us today. Uh, they have a son, Liam. Is he now, what, 26? He'll be 25 in June. 25. Well, I didn't mean to make him older than he is. Uh, he has just, uh, or is just, finishing up his master's? He has finished, and um, he's making a solo trip to Europe. That uh, should be interesting. Uh, his mother is going to worry from the moment he leaves. Uh, already started, right? <laughs> until he comes back. Um, Ed's background is very interesting. He taught... Uh, uh, in schools both in Wisconsin and New Jersey uh, for about 32 years uh, and then retired to Wind Gap where you currently uh, currently reside. Uh, he has uh, won awards for his poetry. Uh, his poems appear in numerous uh, journals and college textbooks and anthologies. Um, if I remember correctly, you've had two poems. Were they read by Garrison Keeler on uh, NPR's uh, Prairie Home Companion? Okay, well, one of our traditions here, uh, because it is the happy hour, is to start with a joke. <laughs> and so that's my role. Um, these are some jokes uh, that I call dumb poet jokes. Now. <laughs> Oops. Not talking about the poet being dumb, <laughs> talking about the jokes being dumb. And you may have heard these, but uh, let's, let's see if we can do this. Okay, I want audience participation. Uh, why didn't the farmer divorce his wife when she traded a cow for a book of poems? Anybody? Because when they got married, he had promised her it would be for butter or verse. <laughs> At least we've got some... <laughs> yeah. Sometimes groans are better, better than that. Okay, what is a simile? A simile is... <laughs> Ed, you'll appreciate this. I don't know if they will, but a simile... <laughs> It's like a metaphor. Okay. So since we, since we got to, since we did that, let me ask you this: what what's what's a metaphor? What's a metaphor? What's a metaphor for you? Huh? What's a matter for you? Well, we'll answer that later. But in, ter in terms of what a metaphor is, it's a place where you graze your cattle. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Why are poets always so poor? Because rhyme doesn't pay. <laughs> and you know that, of course. All right. Why does a male poet pursue the female poet? Because he wanted to meet her. Oh. Uh, well, uh, Enough I, already. You know, <laughs> no, just just one more <laughs> that I came Hurry across. Up, get there quick. <laughs> I, I thought this was good. Uh, a beautiful young woman is sitting in a bar when a man approaches her and says, "Pardon me, miss, but I've been watching you, and I must say that when you smile." It is a sight that makes my heart sing. Well, she blushes a little and says, Oh, thank you, sir. Your words are so beautiful. Are you a poet? He says, No. I'm a dentist. Oh, 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 oh. 
Ben, you've got to do better than I did. Please. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, on both boards, I have uh, a quote by William Carlos Williams, who uh, was the pride of New Jersey, poet from Rutherford, New Jersey. And um, it, it, interesting that he was a medical doctor. He was not, uh, he did not, poetry was not his main uh, uh, source of income. But he came to the conclusion that anything can be grist for a poem. And in fact, two of uh, William Carlos Williams' most famous poems, one deals with a red wheelbarrow, the other one deals with uh, plums. And he took those two topics and, and, and ran with them. Um, the title of my presentation today is technically Poetry is a Coat of Many Colors, um, because what I'm going to try to do is read a couple of poems that deal with a variety of topics. And um, I was thinking about poems that I admire. There's one by Stephen Dobbins that's about shaving cream. And it's what he, it, it, he's shaving, and his little girl, who if I recall is about two or three years old, asks for a little bit of shaving cream in her hand, and he squirts it onto her hand. And then from there, he just goes on to this incredible poem about things that we parents worry about regarding our children. And, uh, but it all started with a little dab of, of shaving cream. And I was also thinking about maybe one of the most famous poems in the American language, uh, Robert Frost's poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, where technically it's a guy on a horse, he's riding along, stops the horse, looks into the forest, stays there for a few seconds, and then continues on his way. That's really all that technically happens in that poem, but it, that last verse, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. It, it just expands that into a whole meditation on what it means to be living and to have responsibilities and, and moments of peace. So um, that's, what I'm going to, that's what I'm going to try to do today and I'm going to sing one song. I'll give you a warning about that because both doors are open and you can <laughs> escape. Um, but I was thinking about poetry is really about words. And there are people who I think feel that poems have all kinds of extra words and the fact is the opposite is true. That most poems get better by getting shorter and by making the words really count. And um, Maybe you have heard this story, but I was thinking uh, the, the, the man who either he started the Salvation Army or he was president, but he was the lead, he was like the CEO of the Salvation Army. And at Christmas time, he decided he wanted to send a telegram to every member of the Salvation Army in America. And he told them what he told the, was at the office and told them the message that he wanted and they, they were, he was then told how much it would cost. And he said, whoa, <laughs> I don't have that much money. And then he shortened his message Then he gave that to the man, he found out the price, he said, I don't have that. And then finally the man said, well, how much money do you have? And he said, well, this is the amount of money that we can spend to send a message to every member of the Salvation Army. And the... A uh, Western Union person said, well, sir, that means you can only send one word. <laughs> and here's the key. And the, the, he said, only one word? Okay. And he wrote this word down and handed it to him. And he said, send this to every member of the Salvation Army. And the word was, others. Always, mm -hmm. Always think about others. others. And, and uh, I was thinking that that's probably a more powerful message than if he had sent a, a full paragraph. And finally, one more, one more thing about words. Um, the Gettysburg Address has 275 words, a little more than a, 
uh, the number of words you would fit on a single piece of typing paper. That's it. The person who followed Lincoln speaking that day, Edward Everett, he spoke for three hours. <laughs> Nobody remembers anything that he said. But the words of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address were so beautifully crafted, uh, probably most of us know at least some phrases from it, um, because of the power, the power of words. Okay, so I'm going to share some poems, and they're going to deal with a variety of topics, um, everything from a, a small store in hometown to dishes breaking to a summer job to um, uh, food that uh, an ethnic group makes and um, and we'll end with a, a, an, a poem about an apostle. So um, this first poem, a while back, about a year ago, I, I quite by accident got interested in a singer named Nancy Griffith. And Nancy Griffith had her very first album. She is standing in front of a Woolworth store on the album cover. And one of her songs on that album is Love at the Five and Dime. And if you go on YouTube, uh, she has this really interesting explanation where she said that she felt that all Woolworths were special. And that got me thinking about my hometown of Woodbridge, New Jersey. And um, growing up in the, in the 1950s, early 1960s, Woolworths was just one of those stores that just seemed to have everything. So um, <coughs> this is a poem. My first poem is called At Woolworths. The counter stretched halfway down the side of Woolworths, where we'd sit on swivel seats enjoying ten-cent Cokes, or on really special days, a Sunday scooped right before our eyes. It seemed Mr. Dahl was manager there forever, his bushy black hair turning salt and pepper, then all salt. Once he reached into his own pocket for a nickel when I was five cents short buying a rubber Zorro sword. But like a caring uncle said no when I tried to buy a penknife when I was only six. I could do all my Christmas shopping in the squeaky wood-floored aisles of Woolworths, perfume in navy blue bottles for my mom and sister, a screwdriver set from my dad, and Hardy Boys books for my brothers. I bought Alvin and the Chipmunk records there in fourth grade, then Beatles 45s in ninth, an official Joe Friday Dragnet badge at age seven, and eight years later, my first can of shaving cream. Growing up, almost everything I needed was at Woolworths, just a bike ride away to cashiers who knew me by name, the greatest store on Main Street, the heart of my hometown. Hank Aaron. When Hank Aaron died last year, he died in January of last year, they repeated um, uh, something from his autobiography that happened to him. And when I read it, I thought it might it might have been the most barbaric form of racism that I had ever read. And there was a baseball stadium in Washington, D.C. called Griffith Stadium that's been torn down, but this, this incident takes place in the 1950s. And Griffith Stadium was such that in the area of Griffith Stadium, if you looked, you could see the Capitol Dome, and that's important for, for this uh, home. And uh, for you, those of you who are not baseball fans, uh, there was a record by Babe Ruth, 714 home runs. And that record was set in 1927, and it remained through the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and the fourth year of the 70s. 
until Hank Aaron broke that. So this is a poem called Breaking. It's in memory of Hank Aaron. Nineteen fifty three in Washington, D.C., Hank Aaron could see the Capitol Dome glistening, symbol of freedom, through the windows of the cafe where he and his black teammates had just finished breakfast. After the waitress took their plates to the kitchen, he heard glassware breaking smashed so no one else would use them, so no one else would eat from plates that had touched the forks that had been in the mouths of black American men. But Hank would answer hate with excellence, playing baseball with a graceful greatness through the 50s, 60s, and on one Atlanta night in 74, did his own breaking, smashing number 715, one more homer than Babe Ruth, whose record stood unshattered for five decades. And in 2002, Aaron returned to Washington, D.C., this time to stand in the White House, just blocks from that cafe, to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President George W. Bush. And as the East Room audience stood and cheered, Hank's face broke into a grand slam smile before sitting down to dine on the first family china. I've had, um, over the years, I've had a lot of part-time jobs uh, when I was young in high school, college. Um, this one, it's a little bit of an intro. Um, this one is uh, about a summer job that I had at a bakery. And uh, <clears throat> we started work at 5 a.m. And we work straight through till usually around 12 o'clock noon, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And um, the man who owned the bakery was, uh, well, I, I don't want to give too much away, but let me, just, let me just say that I think we hear about the greatest generation and we hear about especially men who felt that it was not... <coughs> necessary to always be speaking about their emotions and to always be speaking about their feelings and particularly people, men who served in World War II. I've heard so many times people say that they, their fathers did not want to talk about it, their grandfathers did not want to talk about it, it was just something within them. And we hear now an awful lot about PTSD uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome disorder and things that people carry with them. And um, this incident happened a long, long time ago, obviously, over 50 years ago, but uh, I just wrote this poem in the, in the last couple of months. I've been thinking about it, um, which brings up another issue. I, I think sometimes people think something happens and the poet writes about it immediately. <coughs> Uh, that has not been the case with me many times. Years go by before I actually sit down and write about it. So, uh, maybe after this poem it would be a good time if anybody has any questions or comments or things. So, so this is called Summer Job, 1968. The man who owned the bakery rarely called me by name, never returned my good morning, just growled what he wanted me to do. 
he often seemed someplace else, a blank stare into nowhere. And most summer mornings, we'd bake the rolls and make the pastries in silence. So my last day before going back to college, he shocked me by suddenly calling across the table of steaming breads, Edwin, get over here. And I worried I'd done something wrong, maybe with that tray of jelly donuts. Listen, he almost <coughs> whispered, if you get drafted for Vietnam, you tell them you should go in as an apprentice baker. You've learned enough, more than enough, for that. You hear me? You tell them you're an apprentice baker. Might keep you from getting your head blown off. I was in World War II, Germany. I saw his voice trailed off till he said again, you tell them you're an apprentice baker. Then he gave me my last paycheck. I tried to shake his hand, but he walked away, mumbling over his shoulder, if they give you a problem, tell them to call me. So, I thought this might be a good time if anybody had any questions or comments. Yes? What is your process on writing poems? I know you mentioned in the beginning sometimes the fewer the words the better. What's your process to start a poem and how many revisions do you go to to you? Like, how do you know when it's done and it's final? Oh, that's an excellent question. I'll, I'll just say tons of revisions. Okay. Um, I'm taking my coat off because I'm going to play the guitar and I, I can't play with my coat. Uh, <laughs> but um, usually I, 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 I know, uh, I, I could put it, put it this way. Um, I usually know when a poem is not done. When I, when I have that nagging, gnawing feeling that I'm just not saying what I want to say, um, often I don't know exactly what I want to say when I start a poem. Uh, and in fact, my mentor, uh, Stephen Dunn, who's a very, very renowned poet, um, he used to say, I, it, writing poetry is like walking in the dark. You know, you're, you're kind of searching around. Um, and I think sometimes uh, something will happen while, while I'm writing where I think, well, that's it. That's what I want. Sometimes I'm surprised by uh, uh, what comes out on the paper, especially writing about personal experience where something comes up from the subconscious, maybe. Um, but, uh, but finally, to answer your, your fine question, um, I have some friends who are also poets and uh, we usually will share poems with each other, and I think most of the time we will say, you know, I'm not sure about this part of the poem, or I'm not sure about that part of the poem, so that they can give me some feedback, and I try to do the same for them. Um, but as I get older, and I'm pretty old now, uh, I, I find I love the process of writing. When I was young, I was so eager to get it done, get finished, but, but now I really enjoy kind of fooling around with words and, and seeing where, they, where it takes me. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's not that I'm disappointed when it's done, but uh, I'm much more comfortable with just taking my time with it. You know, so, but thank you for that question. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Or? <coughs> the, the last yes, sir. poem about post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of times, I mean, it, it's in the news now in the last 20 years, but like you said, no one talked about it. But they're, they're trying to like get it. I know there's a group that's like, just drop the disorder, call it post-traumatic stress, because a lot of people seem to have it. It's not really a disorder, it just happens. You know? Right. And, and I, I think, and, and I'm not, you know, it, it was interesting because uh, uh, when I first started Pulling around with that poem, the, the last poem that I read, uh, it was one of the uh, one of my friends that I show, showed it to, and he was the one actually who said, you know, that sounds like someone who has some some unresolved issue that he's still 
uh, dealing with. And I, I can also say, I mean, I'm cheating like crazy now because the poem is supposed to live or die on the page. You're not supposed to <laughs> explain things. But uh, to put it mildly, we never t talked about the Vietnam War. We didn't talk about anything. And, and, and so it really shocked me when out of, truly out of the middle of nowhere, he would make that suggestion. So, um, and I, I think um, sometimes with poems, you, you, I think readers sometimes enjoy if they have the experience of maybe th uh, thinking about things a little bit, that you don't have to spell everything out explicitly. Give, give the reader a chance to kind of see what they're, what they're finding in, in the poem. So, uh, would anyone else like to... I read? think that's what your poetry does. Um, makes, makes me think. Thank you. you. You were never drafted, did you? No, I was not drafted. I, and and um, I was not drafted because I was studying to be a Catholic priest. And I had what was, in those, I don't know if they still have, well, they don't have the draft anymore, but um, they had a classification called 4D. It was 4 divinity. And uh, so, and then when I withdrew, <clears throat> from the seminary program uh, in um, when I was about 21. At that point, they had what was called the draft lottery, where where they your birthday, and my my lottery number was 277, and um, they were <clears throat> they weren't calling that high. So instead, I'll do a song written by someone named Ed McCurdy, and he wrote this in 1950 during the Korean War. <clears throat> and um, I was telling my wife on the way over here from Wingap, um, it's been translated into 80 languages, the song. Um, it's been recorded by many, many people, from Johnny Cash to John Denver to Judy Collins. And interestingly enough, it was recorded by the Kingston Trio. Remember the Kingston Trio? Mm -hmm. the Kingston Trio. They did a studio recording to record it, obviously, but then they found that they could not do it in person, in concert, because two of the Kingston Trio would start crying oh. while they were doing this song. And they, they just said, we, we can't do this. Um, I'm not going to start crying. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I have to clean uh, it. <laughs> But, uh, so, so this is a very, That's very not short song. It's not a ten. It's a strange, gigantic strange. I ever had before. I dreamed the world had all agreed to put an end to war. I dreamed. I saw a mighty room. The room was filled with women and men, and the paper they were signing said they'd never fight again. And when the paper was all signed, and a million copies made They all joined hands Circled round And grateful prayers were made And the people out in the streets below Were dancing round and round with swords and guns and uniforms all scattered on Last night I had the strangest dream I ever had before I dreamed the world had all Put an end to war. 
I dreamed the world had finally agreed to put an end Uh, you've learned uh, this week with uh, in the news that they've announced that the United States is planning to try to take 100,000 Ukrainian refugees uh, into America and <clears throat> I immediately thought of um, where I grew up in Woodbridge in in the 1950s we had a big influx of Hungarian refugees in, around 1956, 1957, around that time. And in 1956, the Hungarians attempted a revolt against the Russian occupation, which was uh, brutally squashed by the, by the Russian government. They brought in tanks and, and very, very, um, very similar to what happened in, in the Ukraine and people scattered trying to escape the, the carnage of, of, this, of the Russian invasion. And many of those who escaped came to America and of course the, the root word of refugee is someone who seeks refuge. And we had a Catholic Hungarian parish in our town, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and they sponsored a big group of hung Hungarian refugees and they came into our neighborhood. And uh, <clears throat> I've written another poem about, about that experience. But this is about something that happened. Um, uh, well, uh, it'll, it'll be clear in the poem, I think. But uh, I'll just say that my dad died very suddenly at age 53. Um, he was very healthy. Um, and uh, I had lunch with him and 20 minutes later he was dead. Uh, he died of a, a cerebral uh, hemorrhage. And my dad, uh, I grew up in the house that my dad grew up in, so he had very strong roots in the neighborhood. And um, so when news of his death uh, came out, all these uh, neighbors and friends, and uh, they all kind of came to our house. So um, I'm going to have to try to pronounce some Hungarian in this poem, so I ask your indulgence with that. But uh, this was something that happened that day that I think has a lot of relation to uh, Ukrainians who are escaping their country. <clears throat> so this is called, On the day my father died, Hungarian refugees bring food. Above the voices of grief in our kitchen, I heard a knock at our front door and found Hungarian refugee neighbors with my buddy Tibor, who already knew some English. They were crying as they stood with bowls of goulash and pastry trays of orracha. They whispered, Sanjolam, Sanjolam. And Tibor said, we are sorry about your father. Mrs. Takash repeated over and over, y'all ember. And Tibor told me, she says your father was a good man. My mother invited them to join our other neighbors, but they just wanted to give us dishes and plates still warm beneath wax paper filled with the savory and sweet gifts of friendship and condolence from the homeland they were forced to flee. They all hugged my mother and me, then stepped down from our porch 
and look like angels beneath the gold of Albert Street streetlights. Mrs. Hegedus called up from the sidewalk, Istan Aljan, and Tibor said, it means God bless you. And I did my best to answer Istan Oljan, a Hungarian prayer in our American night. What was that last line? A Hungarian prayer in our American night. Okay. Um, anybody have any uh, final questions or anything you would like to raise before I do my last one here. I, I do. Sure. Yeah. When are you coming back? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you were going to say, when are you leaving? <laughs> uh, I had some water here. So it's on the floor. And you, yes? Will you, formally, will you quote it from the, the greatest generation? Is that what you were referring to? Yes, yes. Yeah, I read a few stories in that. I was particularly a person, I believe it was Bob Dole and uh, Daniel Inouye. Yes. Mm -hmm. were in uh, a mountain division uh, sent to fight the Germans in northern Italy. They both lost their, their arms. And uh, Inouye was on, after the hospital, uh, was on his way home and uh, thought he should get a haircut. And uh, he went in the barber shop, and the barber said to him, are you Japanese? He said, uh, my father was Japanese. And he said, well, we don't cut Japanese hair. And the whole in a way said was, I feel sorry for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there's um, so many... So many stories like that, and, and uh, uh, the, the uh, World War II, tr they were segregated troops in those days. It was President Truman who first integrated the, the army uh, when, he, when he took over. But um, yeah, um, I, in regard to the, uh, the, the Hank Aaron poem where they, I, I was thinking, how much hate do you have to have? To literally destroy your own property, which is what the what the the, the uh, luncheonette lady was doing. I mean, that's a lot of hate. To you know, but uh, uh, it just um, when I read that incident, it just and and originally we were talking about when a poem was done. Originally, the title of that poem was "Last Laugh," because I was thinking Hank Aaron got the last laugh because. He goes up to the White House and he receives the highest single uh, civilian award that you can receive. You know, so. And you know, yes, sir. There's something that popped in my mind listening to these things. And this area around here, first settlers were primarily German. During World War I, the non Germans didn't talk to them. And in World War II, it happened again, but not to the same degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, every now and then, that gets me. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, sure. Um, Overnight, I, the neighbor doesn't talk to you. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it, 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 it's almost like the ripples of all of the, the war, and uh, you know, they, they even begin to infiltrate our own you know, our own shores. So, and of course, we don't even have to talk about the internment camps of the, that the Japanese were placed in in World War II. So, no, it was, uh, those, those were, were big issues, big issues. So, and, uh, so I'm going to, to end with this. And I'll just say, you know, uh, I really love coming here. And, and uh, I've done, I won't bore you, I've done some, I've done a lot of readings in a lot of places, uh, and uh, I read in Ireland, I read in New York City, 
I read in a bar in Trenton one time where the other people didn't realize I was giving a reading and somebody told me to shut up. <laughs> Whoa. And, and, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really, really nice to, to come here. And, and my wife Mary and I really love coming here. And, and thank you for inviting me uh, again. Uh, so, okay. The last couple of years I, I've been doing a poem for Holy Week. And, um, and this is a, a poem, uh, I know we're uh, uh, still a couple of weeks till Holy Week, but um, I wanted to read this for you, because this has always made an impression on me, something that happens tonight, and it has to do with uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter. And I'm just going to read three sentences from Mark um, before uh, I read the actual poem. So this is from Mark, chapter 14. A maid saw him again and began to say to them who stood by, This is one of them. And Peter denied it again. And a little after they who stood by said again to Peter, Surely you are one of them. You're a Galilean. But Peter began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know this man you are talking about. And for the second time, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had told him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter broke down and wept. And the poem is simply called Peter. And it's for Holy Week 2022. Fishermen were a rough bunch, and I picture Peter looking like a linebacker, big, burly, muscular. But that night, terror turned him to jelly, and he did what he'd boasted he would never do, insist that he did not know Jesus. And Jesus forgave him for turning on him forgave Peter, the rock upon whom Jesus would build his church, the one whom fear had crushed, his tears overflowing like a river of remorse as they led his friend away. Well, thank you everybody for coming today. and. It's a pleasure.